Welcome to Washed by the Word. I'm Pastor Khan, and I wanted to personally welcome you to our Sunday morning service as we go verse by verse through God's Word. It's our desire here by Washed by the Word that the Spirit of God will speak to you intimately as we go verse by verse through His Word. So welcome again to our Sunday morning service, and I look forward to hearing from all of you sharing with us what God has shown you today as you get washed by the Word. All right. Well, we are in 2 Kings today. 2 Kings chapter 13. We covered 13 last week, but we ended in verse 19. Uh, before we jump into the text, we're going to do 13 and 14 today. Some cool things in here, guys. This is kind of a fun chapter and a half. But let's just set the stage very quickly. We've got like six minutes to kind of get us all caught up. Those of you that are new here. Dina, what are you doing here? God canceled my flight. Yay! Yes. Good to see you. I just looked at where you were because you're supposed to be at the airport right now. You left like seven minutes ago. You're at 6.30. Nice. Well, that's our evening service. We'll see how that goes. We'll pray maybe you'll come back for tonight. Oh, okay. It's good to see you here, Dina. All right. Uh, yeah, there you are right up front. Whoa, okay. So here we are. So let's take a quick backup and just kind of set the stage again. Most of you are familiar that the nation of Israel, where it's at today, it was there back in biblical times. But the nation of Israel had a civil war, a bloodless civil war, we saw, in 1 Kings 12 there, and it split into two separate nations. Down south, two tribes, Judah and Benjamin, and they took the name of Judah. Jerusalem was their capital city. The northern ten tribes formed another nation, but they retained the name Israel. So we have the ten tribes to the north, the two tribes down south, Judah down south, Israel up north. Combined, they formed the nation of Israel prior to the Civil War, and they form what is Israel today. So we've got these two nations that we're studying now, Israel and Judah. So when we're in Kings and we hear Israel, it's the top ten tribes. When we see Judah, it's the bottom two tribes. One would think that the name Israel would stand for the nation that really followed closely after God, but it's just the opposite. Judah down south was the godly kingdom. Israel up north was an ungodly kingdom. Oftentimes they would worship the true God in a false way. Other times they would just worship false gods. But not once do we ever see the nation of Israel, the top ten tribes, in good standing in their relationship with God. They had ungodly leadership every time. And they had many different families. They call them the house of. The house of Jeroboam. The house of Omri. The house of Jehu. These are all separate families that take over that kingdom and reign through intrigue, assassination, all kinds of weird stuff going on all the time. But it's always ungodly kings up north. Their capital city, by King Omri, he made this, this city, he called the city Samaria. So when we're in the Old Testament, the capital city of Israel, this northern ten tribes, is Samaria. Later on, that whole part of Israel is called Samaria and the Samaritans and all. But when we're in the Old Testament, it's just the capital city. The capital city, Samaria, of Israel. The capital city of Judah, Jerusalem. So two capital cities. Up north, godly or ungodly kings? Always ungodly kings. Down south in Jerusalem, where God said, I want to be worshipped in Jerusalem. Down south in Jerusalem, sometimes we had a godly king. Sometimes we didn't have a godly king. And that's what we're looking at as we go through the kings. The godly kings down south sometimes. The ungodly kings down south sometimes. But they were all in the line of David. So the Davidic line, the messianic line. These are all the great, 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 great grandparents of Jesus. This line from David goes all the way down to Joseph. And this line, when it gets to David, it, it branches off with a son he has, Nathan, but it branches off, and you follow that down, it goes down to Mary. 
So Jesus, both his mom, his blood mom, his birth mom, and the dad that raised him up, Mary and Joseph, were both in the lineage that tie into David, but two different branches. But they both go down to Jesus. So we're looking at the great, great, great grandparents of Jesus when we're looking at Judah. So we have these two lines. Now what I'd like to do is just stick up on the, the screen quick the line that is in Judah coming under Jehoshaphat. Asa was godly. That was Jehoshaphat's dad. And then Jehoshaphat became king, remember? And he had a great idea. As he was reigning, there was a king up north named Ahab. He was married to the lady named um, Jezebel. And he thought, wouldn't it be grand if I had my son marry their daughter, we could kind of get together because that's what they did back then, remember? You would intermarry with your enemy and then your family and then it goes better. And he thought, what a great idea. I'm a godly man. I'll marry my son off to a very pretty young girl, Jezebel's daughter. What could possibly go wrong? And oh man, whenever you get married on looks rather than godliness, good luck with that. Well, he does it and it's a nightmare. It's a nightmare. So he marries, he gives his son Jehoram, and he takes for his wife, the daughter of Ahab, a gal named Athaliah. They get married and things go bad. They have a son named Ahaziah. Now both Jehoram and Ahaziah are ungodly kings. Not surprised, because Jehoram marries an ungodly woman. So here he was raised up in the house of Jehoshaphat, we talk about righteousness, remember, in that white robe of righteousness. We say, take a white glove on and take your white glove and stick it in a mud puddle and basically that's who he married. He married someone down in the dirt. And if you take your white glove, the righteousness of Christ that you walk in, and you go out into the world and stick that white glove into a mud puddle, that, glove never gets all glove, that mud puddle never gets all glovey. But that white glove will definitely get all muddy. And that's what happened to Jehoram. He marries an ungodly woman and he just spirals down. They have a little boy, Ahaziah. What chance does Ahaziah have being raised in an ungodly home with a mom like Athaliah, ungodly again? Then Ahaziah, he has a sister. The sister, her name is Jehosheba, or Jehosheba, however you want to pronounce it. Well, Ahaziah dies, we saw in the last couple chapters. And the mom, Athaliah, ungodly as ungodly can be, says, wait a minute, I'm the queen mom. My husband died, my son is a king, now he died. If I just kill all my grandkids, I'll be the queen. So she does. She kills all of her grandkids. Can you imagine? However, Athaliah, not Athaliah, Ahaziah, has a sister, this Jehosheba, and she's married to a godly priest, Jehoiada. So she's married to this godly priest. She's the sister of Ahaziah, and Athaliah is massacring the family. She goes and grabs this little baby, Joash, and she hides him in a furniture storage room for seven years. She hides him in and puts a nurse in there and he's the only descendant of David, male descendant of David at this point. The messianic line is dependent on that little baby in that little furniture room. And all of a sudden, as we saw, when he's seven, they bring him out and they proclaim him king and the place goes crazy and uh, Athaliah dies. Athaliah is to Judah what Jezebel is to Israel, two ungodly women who have power, lust, and try to lead God's people, destroy God's people. And both of them are destroyed as we saw. So it was one of those moments, but that is this line that we're looking at. So Joash at age seven, as long as his uncle Jehoiada is the priest, he does godly things, man, it's awesome, but Jehoiada dies when he gets older. And Joash as a man slips away from following the Lord, and that can happen. And he slips away from following the Lord. And as an end result, he's assassinated by his own people. And they put his son 
on the throne. We'll be looking at that a little bit more today. Amaziah in chapter 14. So these are just the kings in the Davidic line. Jehoshaphat, Godly, Jehoram, Ahaziah, Athaliah, yuh, 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 Joash, really good, and then fizzles out at the end, and Amaziah. And we'll be looking at Amaziah in chapter 14. So we got it. That's down in Judah. We got all these names, guys. So we got to just cover this for a few minutes to make sure we understand. Otherwise, we just have that blank look and we start looking at watches and go, oh, what's going on? So we got it. We got it. Now let's look. We'll go up north and take a quick look up there. The house of Omri. Omri had a son. His name was Ahab, a very wicked king. He married Jezebel. They bring in Baal worship into the land up in Israel. He has a son, Ahaziah, in 2 Kings chapter 1. Remember, he falls through the lattice, and am I going to die or not? And you're going to die, and he dies. And then his brother, Jehoram. Notice the problem as you look at this, and this is where it gets so confusing if you're just reading it. Notice that Ahab had a son named Ahaziah and Jehoram. Notice that Jehoshaphat called his son Jehoram, and then there's, they named their son after the uncle that fell through the lattice and died, Ahaziah. So you've got Ahaziah, Jehoram's in both sides of the up north, down south. It's like, what in the world is going on? You know. So we have kings with the same names, and we say, how crazy would that be to have leaders with the same names? I'm glad we don't have that in our country, George Bush and George Bush. So you see, it's this common thing. It's just kind of confusing as you're reading it. It's like, what in the world? So you kind of have that a little bit. Remember Athaliah? That was a daughter of Ahab, so she belongs up there with Ahab, Ahaziah, Jehoram. She marries a Jehoram in Judah, and you see what's going on there. So that's what that is. Well, then God raises up a general. And God sends a message to Elisha. Elisha sends one of his students from the school of prophets and says, go anoint the general of the army, the northern army of Israel, as the new king, and tell him to wipe out the house of Omri. His name was Jehu. And Jehu does. And we looked at that as Jehu completely destroyed the house of Omri. It had nothing to do with God. Nothing to do with God. Omri was just a, a king up in Israel. The real king is down here in Judah. So Jehu wipes him out. And then he promises Jehu, even though Jehu wiped him out and got rid of a lot of Baal worship, and in fact got rid of all of Baal worship, but he still let them worship the true God falsely. And it says he didn't do everything that God wanted him to do in his heart. But God says, you did do. You wiped out the house of Amr. You got rid of Baal worship. What I'm going to do is I'm going to put a king on your throne to the fourth generation. And that's what we're looking at today in chapter 14 as well. We're going to be looking at Amaziah in chapter 14, the king of Judah. And we're going to look at the house of Jehu. Now, Jehu has died. We've already seen him die. And then last week, remember, we looked at Jehoahaz, and he died, and we looked at Jehoash, or Joash, it's like David and Davy, you know, it's the same name, just a different way of saying it. We looked at him, and then, at the end of chapter 14, we're going to look at that fourth generation. We have Jehu, one, Jehoahaz, two, Joash, three, and then we're going to look, just to keep things confusing, that fourth king who's really powerful, really prosperous, really an amazing king up in Israel. I mean, he got the economy going. He got their military going. He's got everything going, but he leaves the country morally and spiritually bankrupt. So they've got everything the world says you should have, but they're morally and spiritually bankrupt, and it brings their ultimate demise in just a couple of chapters. And that king's name, to make it confusing, was Jeroboam. Another Jeroboam. They just keep doing that. So this is Jeroboam, but he's known as Jeroboam II. We could call him Junior if you wanted to, but it didn't, he wasn't related to Jeroboam. It's sort of like, think of George Washington Carver. Not related to George Washington at all, the same name. So it's not George Washington Carver, it's Jeroboam II. Has nothing to do with Jeroboam I, except they were both really ungodly. So that's that fourth generation of Jehu. Okay, we got it, kinda? Let's leave it up there until we go to the slide. And Sandy, I, didn't, I forgot to tell you this, but between slides, whenever you can, just pop that back up and then go to a new slide, if you can, and just go ahead and let them see it. Go back and they'll see it. But as long as that one's up a lot, I just want people to kinda see where we're, where we're talking here a little bit. Sorry about that. Okay. Wow. Now we've got to cover the rest of 13 and all of 14 in the next 40 minutes, so we're going to go. Let's do it. We, we picked up, or we left off in chapter 13, verse 21, or verse uh, 19. Verse 19. And you remember 
the king of Israel had gone to Elisha. He had heard Elisha the prophet was dying. He was freaking out because even though he didn't believe in God the right way, he recognized this prophet of God was a main uh, asset for him in his battle against the neighboring enemies and all. So he goes to Elisha. He goes, oh, Elisha. And he acts like a little girl. And Elisha says, knock it off. That was for you. And, and, and he basically says, knock it off. Be a man. He says, open the window to the east, remember. And they open the window to the east, and he says, take a bow in your arrow and shoot that arrow out to the east. So he said that was a way of declaring war on a nation. And that's where Syria was. The Syrians, what, he was freaking out. The king was freaking out over Syria. He says, just shoot an arrow over there. He says, now take a bunch more arrows and keep on shooting. So he shoots an arrow, and he shoots an arrow, and he shoots, he shoots three arrows. He had a quiverful. He shot three arrows. And he says, there, I did it. And Elisha says, man, you blew it. Why didn't you shoot five arrows, six arrows? Why didn't you just shoot arrows? Now that you only shot three arrows, you're only going to have three victories over the king of Syria. If you'd have shot them all, you'd have wiped them out. But he was lethargic in his... Uh, and we talked last week at the end of the study, remember, the arrows in our quiver. And we talked about we have arrows in our quiver, but what do we do with those arrows when we shoot them at our enemy? We talked about the arrow of prayer and how many times we are lethargic with our arrow of prayer. And, and, and we just don't. We just don't. Stopping at Starbucks for a cup of coffee is more important in the morning to many of us than getting over at quarter to ten and praying. So we're going to shoot an arrow at coffee rather than shoot an arrow of prayer. Because we've got to get our priorities right. Coffee is more important than prayer for many of us. Oh, I can't do anything until I have my cup of coffee. Try praying. Oh, that we would say, I can't do anything until I spend my first 15 minutes in prayer. But we don't get that. We're lethargic. We just say, ah, whatever. So have a good week. God bless you all. <laughs> and then we talked about the arrow of the Word of God. And we talked about how important it is to spend time in the Word. And let the Word of God speak to us a lot. Not just spend five minutes in the Word, but spend time in the Word. Truly spend time in the Word. Shoot the arrow, looking at expectantly, what does God have for me? We talked about the arrow of praise, actually worshiping and praising. Thank you. You know you have a worship gift, but if you don't, I'm just going to publicly say it. You have a worship gift. You have the ability to lead people into worship. It's pretty stinking cool. I love our worship team. It's awesome. It's awesome. There was worship going on. When, when we, when we uh, do worship, if you notice, I'm never up front. I'm always in the back. Usually not on the soundboard, but I'm usually back there. And everyone can say, amen to that. Thank you for not being on the soundboard. But at any rate, I'm back there usually. But what I'm doing is I'm watching the body. I'm watching the people that God brings here. Are they worshiping? Are they worshiping or are they singing? Anybody can get up and be a song leader. Turn to page 247, let's sing. But can you lead people into the presence of God? Can you lead people into worship? That is a gift that God gives us as a body so we can worship him, and it's sweet. You see, the worship is not the warm-up for the word. The worship is is coming into his presence and allowing God just to wash over us, to spend time in his presence and to profess to him our love for him. It is not the time to go to the bathroom. It's not the time to go say hi to everybody. I know we all feel we're super important. And Melissa, if I don't say hi to you, well, I don't know if you can even live, you know. So in the middle of worship, I'll come up and say, hey, Melissa, how's it going? And I'll take her right out of the presence of God because here I am. Do you realize what that is, what we're saying? We're saying I'm more important to you then you, it's more important for you to talk to me than it is for you to talk to God right now. We need to start being awake of what we're doing. Worship, praise is coming into his presence and ah. Service starts at 10. Prayer starts at 945. How sweet would it be if all of us are here at 945? How sweet would it be at 945? Not sitting there praying, but actually on our knees praying where we'd have this all filled up and the second row out there and the third row out there and actually pouring our heart out to the Lord. Could you imagine what would happen? We saw what God did with 11 men committed to him. Could you imagine what God would do if we had 40 people committed to him? For real? Why don't you be that one? Instead of talking to each other about us, why don't we talk to God about each other? And oh, what could happen? It could be sweet. The more unworthy you are, 
the more worthy you are. Just come into his presence saying, God, here I am. Shooting the arrows. We talked about shooting the arrows last week, remember. And that's where we ended. Because I went off like I did just now, we didn't finish the chapter. So let's finish the chapter. Here we are. He says, you only struck it three times, man. Now you're going to strike Syria three times. Oh, you blew it. Then it says in verse 20, and here we go in verse 20. It says, then Elisha died. Now, you wonder. It doesn't tell us what Elisha was thinking. But remember, he was with Elijah when they crossed the Jordan River. And he was there. And remember what he said to Elijah right after he was taken up? He said, oh, my father, my father, the chariots of Israel and their horsemen. And they saw the chariot coming and Elijah was taken up in a whirlwind. And remember, he said, I want a double blessing from you and all. And we talked back then, that double blessing. Uh, there's so many ramifications to that, but it's really, have, I want your spirit to come upon me. I want leadership and all. But it is interesting that Elijah, remember, in the scriptures, he's recorded as having done eight miracles. Eight of his miracles are recorded. Elisha, 16 miracles recorded. Double. Interesting. And now he's dying. But Elijah, Elijah, when he died, man, he just walked and said, if you see me going up, you get it. And he's watching Elijah. And Elijah's there. And also here comes his chariot and his horseman and, and his whirlwind. A tornado comes up. And whoosh, up he goes. And he's like, wow, I saw it. Can you imagine? And he said, oh, my father, my father, the, the chariot of Israel and their horsemen. And now the king comes. His, spirit, or his spiritual and his civil authority is the king of Israel. And he comes to his bed, and there's Elisha. He's an old man now. We know he's at least 70. Many say he's up to 120 years old. He's an old man. And he's laying there an old man. He shot the arrow and all, or guided the hands and everything. And now the king comes to him, and he says the exact same thing. Oh, my father, my father, the chariots of Israel and their horsemen in verse 14. And you've got to wonder. You've got to wonder. I tried to put myself in Elisha's place. And if any of you have ever been in a hospital bed, if any of you have ever been in the hospital where the doctors are kind of working on you, you can see the look, and you, you look at your wife, and you look at the people coming up, they say, oh, you look good, and you know they're lying to you. So we're going to pray more. If you ever had them run into an emergency room and come running into you and start doing something, oh my goodness, and you look at your wife and she's crying and she's out in the room and Pastor Anthony's out in the outside of the room consoling her and you're going, what's this? What's going on? You know, it's, it's just me. If you've ever been there, you realize that we can actually die. We tend to think of somebody else. But you can be waking up in the morning feeling great and you can be in the emergency room within a half an hour and then say, well, no, are you going to make this or not? That can happen to you. Two weeks from t uh, t yesterday, I'm going up to Minnesota. I'm going to the funeral of a classmate that I played sports with from kindergarten through post-high school. Play sports all the time together. And just recently, he got killed in a car accident. And it was like, Many of you know, I have a friend here, the lung transplant guy, Larry. He's in hospice now. Every time I go see him, he's morphined up. They're increasing his morphine. You know what that means? Are you in the medical field? You know what that means? <sighs> Death is very real. And we spend far too much time with insignificant things. We spend far too much time worried about getting our feelings hurt than telling people of Christ and being nice to each other. It's not about me and it's not about you. It's not. It's about Jesus. Amen. And we've been given an opportunity to be in this life, to know him, and we have got to stop thinking that it's about us. And you hurt my feelings, so I'm just mad. Shut up. It's not about you. Of course your feelings are hurt. That's just a sign of a narcissist. Because your focus is on you. Well, now I hurt everybody's feelings. Shut up. You're going to tell me you're not a narcissist? Really? Really? Who's the most important person in the world to you? Be honest. 
Okay, so there we are. Jesus knew it. He says, love your neighbor like you love yourself. He says, be nice. Be nice. We've got to get our focus off of ourselves onto other people, but mostly onto Christ and onto other people. We have people all around us who don't know Christ and are going to hell. We have people all around us that go to church every Sunday and they're going to hell. Because they know church, they don't know Christ. They know what to say, but they don't know Jesus. It's so important, guys, I can't even begin to tell you. But at any rate, here's Elisha. He's dying. Not the way he expected, more likely than not. I, I've got to wonder, double blessing? I got twice the miracles recorded in Scripture. He doesn't know it yet, but you know. So I'm waiting for the, my whirlwind to come in. And now he's getting sick, and now he's dying. And the king comes in and says the exact same phrase, the chariots of Israel and their horsemen. Yeah. It's not happening. It's not happening. And then he dies. You see, death is no respecter of persons. It's appointed unto man once to um, die. That's Bible. You're going to die. Some of us sooner than others. Some of us are going to try our best to hang on as long as possible. But you're going to die. Or you're going to be raptured. But either way, we're done. We're done. It's a reminder. So if you want a real fun thing, underline and Elisha, or then Elisha died, just underline it in your Bible, highlight it, and put off the margin, I will too. Say, whoa, okay. Don't like writing that, but you're going to die. So let's get ready for that now. Let's live a life that has meaning now. Let's be nice to each other now. Let's love each other now. Let's talk about each other to the Lord and let's just love each other. And let's forgive each other all the time. All the time. We say, if you don't like something, leave. But we're talking about, in the fellowship, vote with your feet. But it's not when you get offended. That's just the sign of being self-centered. We leave if there's error in doctrine. Get out of here. But because someone didn't say hi to you, you don't leave. That's being a baby. Someone didn't say hi to you. Did you say hi to them? Say hi to them. They still say hi to you. Check first. How's their hearing? I have very little hearing on this side. If you say hi to me this side, I'm going to walk right on by you. I just will. Talking this ear, I'm going to say hi to you. This ear, forget about it. So be nice. Don't be so sensitive. Just point people to Jesus. Love each other. Hug on each other. I'd like this row to stand up, if you would, please. And this row to stand up, if you would, please. And this row to stand up, if you would, please. Now, those of you that are standing up, I'd like you to turn around and look at me. Now look at the people right in front of you. Just look at them. Tell them you love them. Go ahead, just tell them I love you. What did they say back to you? Anybody say anything back to you when you did that? What did they say back to you? I love you too. Isn't that crazy? That's how that works. Do that. Do that. Just tell people that you love them. It's okay. It's kind of weird, but do it. <laughs> Just do it. Just tell people you love them. Just love them. I did it with Paul last week. I love you, Paul. See what he did? You want to feel loved here? Well, then love somebody. Amen. And you'll get loved. Just tell them you love them. I said, Paul, Paul, I love you. He said, I love you, kind. I said, oh, I feel good. He says, I love it when you do that. Thanks. It just makes you feel good. It's just good. Tell people you love them. For real. Just look him in the eyes and say, I love you. It's all right. He died. That was a long thing on Elisha died, man. And they buried him. We got to hustle. And they buried him. No funeral. I found that interesting. Remember, I'm a funeral director for a number of years. Own three funeral homes, manage two. So I'm a funeral director. For 15 years, I was a funeral director. I like funerals. But I can't find an elaborate funeral in the Bible for any believer. I found that so interesting. I didn't like to bring that up, but I'm bringing it up. I've been out long enough to bring it up. Because that's kind of interesting. Elaborate funerals are the things of pagans. <coughs> Paul says, this body, when it goes, it's a tent. It's a used-up, worn-out tent. We get rid of it. Cremation, okay? Of course it's okay. 
Burial okay? Of course it's okay. Burial at sea, it's okay? Of course it's okay. Makes no difference. It's a used up tent. Don't, put into, don't be put into the trap that your love is measured for your family member by how much money you spend on their funeral. It has nothing to do with that. If you want to show how much love you, for, you have for your family, tell your family about Jesus. That's how you show you have love for your family, not about how much you spend on a funeral. But you tell them about Jesus. And you live a Christian life. Now, if you want a big, fancy funeral, God bless you. Have a big, fancy funeral. That's cool. But if you say, I don't want a big, fancy, fancy funeral, that's fine. It makes no difference. That's cool, too. What's important is that you live a life that reflects Christ. And you lead people to Jesus. And after you die, they still remember your testimony. That's how we live a life. Elisha, man, he's a mighty man of God. Just says that he died and they buried him. I look at Jesus. He died. They entombed him. No big funeral for Jesus. Moses wouldn't even know. Somewhere up on by Mount Nebo up there somewhere. Do they mourn him? Of course they mourn him. Do they grieve him? Of course they grieve him. But it's not in all the stuff. It's in remembering a life that was lived and giving glory to God and rejoicing that they made, the, they made, their, uh, they made it. They're in glory. They're with the Lord. And we can rejoice. So, he died and they buried him. And the raiding bands from Moab invaded the land in the spring of the year. Interesting, they didn't invade until Elisha died. Once Elisha died, now here comes the invasion. It's almost like the king of Israel said, you know, your presence here is doing something. What are you going to do? What are we going to do when you die? He says, shoot the arrow. Well, here they come on in. And so it was as they were burying a man. They're out there having a little quick burial that suddenly there's a band of raiders coming in from the Moabites. And they put the man, they just tossed him quickly into the tomb of Elisha. We'll come back and take care of it later. They put the man in the tomb of Elisha. When the man was let down, he touched the bones of Elisha. Oh, this is weird now. And he revived and stood up. That's just crazy right there. Is it true? Yeah, it says it right there. It's true. But it's crazy. We look at Elijah and Elisha, and the two prophets are responsible for all three resurrections in the Old Testament. God worked through Elijah and Elisha. Three in the Old Testament. Interesting number. And there were seven resurrections recorded in the New Testament, interestingly enough. I just find it three and seven. That's so interesting. But at any rate, as we look at the Old Testament accounts, Elijah there in 1 Kings 17, remember, he, he brings to life that widow's son. And then Elisha, over in 2 Kings, remember, brings to life the Shumanite's son. The Shunammite's son. Interesting. And now Elisha, after he has died, God is still alive, and so is Elisha. And Elisha's burial brings about a resurrection. And we talk in Scripture how Elisha is a type of Christ, and we can go on and on with that because that's loaded with significance. But it's the 16th miracle recorded to Elisha, and it takes place after his death. Elisha has twice the number of resurrections as Elijah. Remember the double blessing and all? It's just, there's so many little things. We're not going to get into all that, but it's just kind of cool. But God honored Elijah at his departure from this world. Remember? Up he goes. He honors Elisha after his death also by working a miracle there in his tomb. Just an interesting, interesting thing. Well, a guy by the name of Adam Clark, he was a Methodist pastor. He wrote a huge commentary in the Bible. If you get a, a Clark commentary, that's back in the days when the Methodists were on fire for Jesus. They taught that you had to be born again, and they were just like, Burr. and you get a hold of the Clark commentary, it's pretty stinking good stuff. Well, Adam Clark said this on the Elisha his bones bringing this guy to life. He says, this is the first and I believe the last time a true miracle is performed by the bones of a dead man. He says, and yet, on this account, many churches over the years have, estal have established relics and bones of saints to be prayed to and venerated. And it's true. It's amazing they keep the bones of people. Connie and I were in Bulgaria, went down to the Rila Monastery, south of Sofia. Beautiful monastery. And in their chapel, they have a box of bones. And it looks like a, 
like if those of you that fish, it looks like a tackle box almost. Little, little squares. And they got bones of martyrs there. And people will go there and light a candle to these bones and venerate. They don't worship, they venerate. I don't know what the difference is. It looks the same to me. But at any rate, these bones. When I was in Spain, I saw the head, the skull of John the Baptist. When I was in Istanbul, I saw the skull of John the Baptist. And as I was reading, I found there are five skulls of John the Baptist throughout Europe, which really makes me look at him differently now when I think of John the Baptist. Like five heads, wow. But they've got these skulls that they venerate. And it's so ridiculous. Religious relics, so ridiculous. We don't venerate bones of saints. But we can learn from these prophets. We're not going to venerate their bones. But we can learn from the books that their lives are recorded in and the books that the prophets have written. Dead prophets have tremendous significance to us when their writings are contained in the Word of God. And you can come to life by being in touch with the books of the dead prophets, just as this man came to life by coming in touch with the bones of this dead prophet. Get into the Word of God and watch what God will do. Well, this guy came to life. We get into verse 22. And Hazael, the king of Syria, he oppressed Israel all the days of Jehoiaz. Now see Jeho Jehoiaz under the house of Jehu up there? When he's king now, remember he was the one that was freaking out and he prayed and God listened to him? All those days, Hazael was busy oppressing him. And we knew that was going to happen because if we go back into 2 Kings chapter 8, there we see something in verse 7. 2 Kings 8, verse 7. It says, Then Elisha went to Damascus, and Ben-Hadad, remember there's a title, king of Syria was sick, and was told him, saying, The man of God has come here. And the king, Ben-Hadad, said to Hazael, Take a present in your hand, and go meet this man of God, Elisha, and inquire of the Lord by him, saying, Shall I recover from this disease? So Hazael went to meet him, and took a present with him of every good thing of Damascus, forty camel loads. He came and stood before him and said, Your son, Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, sent me to you, saying, Shall I recover from this disease, and Elisha said to him, Go say to him, You shall certainly recover. However, the Lord has shown me that he will really die. Then he set his countenance in a stare, Elisha did, until Hazael was ashamed. And the man of God wept. And Hazael said, Why is my Lord weeping? And he says, Because I know, check out this prophecy, because I know the evil that you will do to the children of Israel. Speaking to Hazael, he wasn't a king. He says, I know their strongholds you will set on fire and their young men you will kill with the sword and you will dash their children and rip open their women who are with child. Hazel said, what is your servant? What are you calling me, a dog? That he should do this gross thing? And Elisha answered, the Lord has shown me that you will become king over Syria. Then he departed from Elisha, came to his master, Ben-Hadad, who said to him, what did Elisha say to you? And he said, he told me you're going to surely recover. But it happened on the next day that Hazael took a thick cloth, dipped it in water, and spread it over his face so that he died, and Hazael reigned in his place. So there we see the prophecy that Hazael is going to oppress the children of Israel, going to, 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 to really come on hard on the children of Israel. And now we come into chapter 13. It says, And Hazael, verse 22, king of Syria, oppressed Israel all the days of Jehoiahaz. And we see that this was allowed, even planned by the Lord. Isn't that something? It was planned by the Lord as a way to discipline the nation of Israel. Wow. Their false worship of a true God. Those of you who are parents, have you ever disciplined your children? Don't they just love it? <laughs> oh, good, I get to be disciplined. Yay! Doesn't work that way. Disciplining a child is tough. Have you ever tried disciplining your children when the grandparents are around? <laughs> oh, man. Now, don't be so rough on him. What's wrong with you? <laughs> you know. And then all of a sudden, I became a grandparent. And I see him disciplining our grandkids. I say, don't be so rough on them. What's wrong with you? But, you know. In the book of Hebrews, it says this. No, son, my son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, 
the discipline of the Lord. Don't be discouraged when you're rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening or discipline, God deals with you as with sons. You're part of the family. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? But if you're without chastening, of which all become partakers, then you are illegitimate. You're not sons of the family. Furthermore, we've had human fathers who corrected us, and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? For they indeed for a few days chasten us, it seems best to them. But he for our profit, that we may be partakers of his holiness. Now no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. You ever been put under discipline by your family, by your employer? What do we typically do? We find someone to complain to. Because they just don't get it. They don't understand Nevertheless, afterward, it yields a peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Therefore, strengthen the hands which hang down because of their discipline and the feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may be not dislocated but rather healed. Do you understand what he's saying? There's going to be times when we're going to go through discipline. The response is not, if, if you're under dis discipline, Walter, I can't come to you and say, well, tell me all about it, you poor boy. <laughs> it feels... That removes the, the hand of God from working in his life so he can have peaceable fruit of righteousness and can be restored. And if I sit there and give you that ear, I ruin what God is doing to you. Discipline is not fun for anybody who goes through it. But the Bible says it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness. So let's take a look at here now. Because God is disciplining his own people there in Israel because of their lack of respect for him. They're going to worship him their way, not his way. And Hazael, king of Syria, oppressed Israel all the days of Jehoiaz. But the Lord was gracious to them. There was grace he had compassion on them. There was compassion. And he regarded them. Why? Because of the covenant that he had with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he would not destroy them or cast them from his presence. And we see the key to true discipline. There needs to be grace and compassion. Keep them in the presence of God. Discipline. Not fun. but let God do the discipline. We have something here called church discipline. In Galatians chapter 6, it talks about that. It says, Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you are spiritual Restore such a one, notice how, in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourselves as you also be tempted. The purpose of church discipline is restoration. It says, you who are spiritual, restore such a one. God raises up leadership in a church and works through them to restore people back into the right relationship with God. I went through church discipline. Anybody else go through church discipline besides me? Can I see hands? <laughs> the leadership. Our leadership's all been church discipline. It's great, isn't it? It's awesome. But church discipline is an interesting thing. Is it fun at the time? No. It's not fun at the time. And the temptation to run to anybody who will listen and dump all over him. If I'm under church discipline, David, and you're going to give me an ear, I'm going to be all over you. You'll be my new best friend. And I'm going to do my best to convince you to be on my side. And if you are foolish enough to listen to me and remove me from church discipline, I will not have the opportunity to be restored. So just tell me to go back to me. Or to me. Go back to the church. And so you need to deal with whoever they've got you dealing with. And get right, and then we'll talk. It's so important, you who are spiritual, speaking of the spiritual leadership, 
Restore him with a spirit of gentleness and love. So important. So important. We see God doing that. Look at what he does. The Lord is gracious. I disciplined my daughter as I was raising her because I loved her. In the midst of discipline, it's hard to convince her of that. Real hard. As she got older, it was really difficult. No, you're not going to date him. But dad, he's the only one in school taller than me. She was 6'1 in Santa Fe. Really small market. <laughs> it just was. It just was. And no, you're not dating him just because he's tall. That's not going to work. But I can wear heels with him. <laughs> then go barefoot with someone else. But you're not going to date that guy. It was not pleasant for her. Could you imagine having me as a dad when I was really strict? Oh man, poor thing. But then we sent her to the East Coast, to Christian University, the largest one in the world at that time. And one of the first things she called me, Dad, there are not only taller guys, there's a lot of girls taller than me out here. This is great. And she was all excited because her height was no longer an issue. She married a 6'5 dude and she's all happy. She can wear heels. But bottom line was he was godly. He was godly. She did not think it was a great idea when I said, no, that's not your guy. Trust me. You don't understand. So she sneaked around by my back, you know, all this stuff. She has since asked forgiveness, which thrills me as a dad. Dad, thank you so much for not allowing me to do all that. And I did sneak a couple times. I said, I know. So you forgive me for that? <laughs> of course I will. Of course I will. Discipline at the time is not fun but it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness if we'll let God be God. Hard sometimes, because we want to fix it. Let God be God. Let God deal with his kids. He will. He will. But the Lord was gracious to them. He had compassion on them and regarded them. He would not destroy them or cast them from his presence. Now Hazael, king of Syria, died, and Ben-Hadad, his son, reigned in his place. And Jehoash, the son of Jehoaz, this is that Joash we saw in chapter 13. He recaptured from the hand of Ben-Hadad, the son of Hazael, the cities which had been taken out of the hand of Jehoaz, his father, by war. So now, all of a sudden, Jehoash starts to have victory over the Syrians. He starts taking cities away. They start meeting each other. They start fighting with each other. And he actually defeats them. How many times? Three times. How many times did he shoot that arrow out the window? Three, three times. And Elias just says, oh man, if you'd have shot six or seven, you'd have wiped them out. You only shot three. And I want to encourage us today. Don't be just a partial shooter of your arrows. When you pray, pray with fervency. When you get in the Word, get in the Word with fervency. A lot. Pray a lot. Get in the Word a lot. Spend time and worship a lot and worship. Shoot your arrow, shoot your arrow, shoot your arrow, shoot your arrow. The enemy's going to try his best to stop you. The enemy's going to try his best to get in your head, to focus on me, to focus on, on the pastors, to focus on the fans, to focus on your glasses. Are those news glasses? Okay. If they were, we could focus on them. We could focus on them. But anything, I was, they all shake their heads. No, oh, they're not new. Anybody got new glasses? But at any rate, so we're, but we can focus on things we shouldn't be focusing on in here. Let's just focus on the Lord and let the Spirit of God speak to our heart. Amen. It's not the pastor. It's not the fans. It's not the glasses. It's the word of God in Jesus. And let the Lord speak to you. He loves you so much. He wants to come alongside of you and bless you and work through you. But shoot the arrows and do what's right. Three times Joash defeated them and recaptured the cities of Israel. Could have been so much greater. God had so much for him, but his lethargy cost him. God had so many victories for him but he just didn't even try. Don't let that be you today, guys. Don't let that be you. Well, we got chapter 14. That's next week for sure. So <laughs> we finish up chapter 13. As we look at chapter 13, it's just, man, God is good, is he not? 
He loves you so much. From speaking from the perspective of someone who's been through church discipline, I am so thankful for the seven men that came around me in the midst of my church discipline. John Panic, Jim Williams, Carlo Costco, Matt Walsh. I forgot Bobby's last name. What's Bobby's last name? Bobby? <laughs> These men that came around me and encouraged me in the midst of discipline but would not allow me to talk bad about my pastor. I wanted to. <laughs> I wanted to. They said, no, 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 no. We're in this for the long haul. They prayed with me. They kept making me go back to my authorities. Guess what happened? I got restored. Guess what happened? I got a letter from my pastor saying, you completed the two-year restoration program. So proud of you. Maybe you and I can write a book together about this. Go, yeah! It was not easy. It was not fun. I wanted to find an ear that would let me throw up in it. They wouldn't allow me. And God was good. God was good. We exercise some church discipline from time to time. And I want to just ask you, please, if you have a question about someone under church discipline here, come talk to me. I'll have someone with us who is there with us when we exercise the church discipline. And we'll verify and just and we'll verify every word spoken. Church discipline is for restoration, not for eradication. The desire is for them to come back into fellowship. <sighs> Can I? Walter, you were under church discipline here. Can you imagine? Two years you were gone? Three. Three years. He's now one of my right-hand men. I love him like a son. I loved him like a son when you weren't here. I loved him like a son when you came back. It's just what it is. It's just what it is. I've gone through church discipline. Pastor Walter's gone through church discipline. It happens. It's horrible. It's horrible. You feel so rejected and alone and ugh, and then God works. And then it's like, whew, it's so good. So when we go through our times of church discipline at times, and people, when it happens, like I did, and I'm assuming you did, but I, I did for sure, you try and find people to give you an ear. Don't be that ear. Just say, we need to talk. That's great. Let's go talk. To, let's make an appointment. We'll talk to him together. Let's go. And then come in and talk. And we'll sit down with myself and I'll have another pastor with me and you bring in the person and the four of us will talk. Be glad to. Be glad to. But help them get restored. Not dig in the junk. It doesn't work. Don't do that. All right, Lord willing, we'll never do church discipline again. That would be great. Lord willing, the rapture will happen before the worst team even gets up here. That'd even be better. That'd be like way great. But just know that we love you all. We love every one of you. We love you. But more importantly, God loves you. Revel in his love, man. Just love one another. Just love. Just love. Be nice. Let's encourage one another and let's go forward. Life is good. Life is good. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for a time just to get together, to walk through this end portion of this chapter as we see the power that you have even through Elisha's tomb. We think of the tomb that is empty and the power that we have because of the resurrection of Jesus.
We look at how you discipline your people, but when you discipline your people, the grace and compassion that you point towards your people as they go through that. And God, I pray that you would help us to understand that whole principle that when we're under church discipline, when we're around people under church discipline, Lord, it's, it's not being mean, it's being loving. And Lord, it's to, to see the peaceable fruit of righteousness coming from their life. So God, we pray that you would help us just to, to grasp that. Lord, as we get ready to go have fellowship over at the Fellowship Hall, Lord, the, the grilled food, the burgers, the hot dogs, the beans and red chili, the potato chips, the watermelon. Mm, God, bless it. Bless it. And we ask, God, that you would uh, be pleased with what we say and do over these next couple hours over there. In Jesus' name.